Hi, everyone. I'm Steve Altitian. Thanks for joining me for another broadcast of Modern Family Matters. Today, I have Gladys Boutwell, a certified insurance counselor, here with me to discuss what happens to health insurance in a divorce and how to make sure to protect yourself from losing your insurance. So, Gladys, before we start, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for having me today, Steve. Uh, thank you to your audience for being here today. A little bit about me, I have over 20 years experience in corporate America. I've been in financial services my entire career. I uh, was in financial services mainly on the tax side of things and payroll. So that, that was where the majority of my, um, my history is. I have also gone through credit and collections internationally and that was a lot of fun to do. Uh, and I got my uh, MBA from University of Laverne in Laverne, California with uh, an emphasis on international business and leadership and management. So I got a dual concentration. And then I became a certified payroll professional because I was in the payroll industry. So uh, when I got to insurance or I got into insurance back in 2013, it really um, fell in line with a lot of what I had done before because I started working with small business owners and with health insurance and employee benefits, it falls, it goes in through payroll. And then of course, with my background, I was able to understand how it worked, how the pre-tax, post-tax dollars worked. So that made it a lot of fun. Uh, I'm now a certified insurance counselor, which means that I do a lot of um, educating myself on the industry so that I stay up to date uh, with everything that is insurance, not just health insurance, but on the liability side, business side, errors and emissions. So if, if it has to do with insurance, I usually know um, a little bit enough to get myself in trouble sometimes to, uh, to talk to people on that. But uh, I thoroughly enjoy being able to work with business owners. Uh, to help them uh, reach their goals as well as their employees. And I actually um, uh, wrote a book, um, Health Insurance Secrets Revealed. It reached number one on Amazon's best selling. And it teaches people how to understand their insurance because that is so important. Most people don't understand insurance. And so I try to simplify it for them so that they understand how to use it in order to make it easier for them to keep more of their money without having to go out of network and then spend too much money. So that's a little bit about me. Well, thank you. You're the perfect person to talk about this stuff today because, you know, while some of it is legal and has the sort of, you know, what you do in a divorce legality part, much of this is based, as you know, on insurance rules and insurance law. Yep. And so thanks. That's wonderful. So I'm going to start with, you know, you and I both know, that it's pretty common in marriages and, and in partnerships for one spouse or partner to maintain the medical insurance for the entire family. And, you know, sometimes one spouse has cheaper insurance or, or higher quality coverage, or maybe a spouse doesn't work or works with an employer that doesn't provide health insurance. But, you know, whatever the case, divorce can really make a difference and change that arrangement, can't it? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. A lot of things can happen during that pre-divorce, divorce proceedings and after divorce. And sometimes it takes a long time for that process to happen. So a lot of things can happen from the time, the conversation of this is what needs to happen to when it actually happens. A lot can happen in between. Oh my gosh. Well, kind of starting there. Um, if someone you know, terminates their spouses or their partners or their children's insurance, can they just do that? Can they do it before a divorce, while a divorce is ongoing, after a divorce? How does that, how does that work? Well, depends. <laughs> uh, can they? Yes. Should they? Probably not. Uh, so there's the, um, the part of, should they be doing it? Well, no, they probably should not because uh, a decision hasn't been made on their divorce, uh, their final divorce decree that might require them to maintain their spouses and or their children's health insurance. And, but can they actually physically remove somebody? It, it can and it has happened. Uh, and here's the reason why. Depends on the employer. If they go to their employer and says, um, 
I need to remove my spouse because I'm no longer married or I'm separated or whatever it may be, their employer may require proof of loss or they may not. And if they don't require proof of, of uh, or not proof of loss, but proof of coverage somewhere else, um, some employers will require that before they allow that termination to happen. They wanna make sure that everybody in the family is whole. Other employers will simply terminate. You fill out the little form that says remove on this date and they will remove them and not require proof of anything. Uh, and if it's open enrollment for the employee during that time, it just so happens that it's that month of their open enrollment, they can remove a spouse or children without anybody questioning it because during open enrollment, you can add or remove somebody without any proof of a special election. So can it happen? Yes, it can. Should it happen? No, it should not. You know, that makes but it sense. does. Yeah. So let's say I'm on my spouse's or my partner's health insurance and we're getting divorced. There's a divorce and the divorce becomes final. And that's normally when, you know, this, this coverage may end. Isn't that correct? Yes. And then, so what, you know, what happens? Um, how does the process of the disengagement, I guess you would say, of the two on the same insurance policy occur? So what will happen is once the divorce decree code uh, is, uh, is out there and the spouse that has the coverage would go to their employer and said, here's my um, proof of ending of the marriage. I want to remove my spouse and her children or dependents. They're, they're called dependents, even if the, let's say that there's the husband and the wife and the wife makes more than the husband, but the insurance is under the husband, anybody under it are considered dependents. So it that doesn't have to mean that they are fully dependent. It just, that's a terminology used. So any dependents, they can remove them. Uh, they fill out the paperwork or they do it online, depending again on the employer uh, requesting that removal. Once the removal happens, for the most part, not always, but for the most part, the coverage in Oregon will go to the last day of the month of that coverage ending. So if they say the divorce happened today, then the coverage will end at the end of the month, most of the time. However, there are times when that end of coverage will happen the day that it is being requested. Uh, and those are plans that are called self-funded, which are usually larger employers that have those self-funded or hybrid self-funded plans. They look similar to any other plan, uh, but it, it just depends on the employer. So uh, it's always important to ask the benefits person or the HR person, when is this coverage gonna end? If there's an am amicable divorce, a lot of times the uh, spouse that holds the insurance will let the other spouse know your insurance is gonna end on this day. Now, the, usually the, they are notified. The party that has lost coverage will normally get notified saying, this is your last day of coverage. Here are your options. You can either go on through marketplace or directly with the carrier. Uh, you can, and it, it all depends again, how large is the employer? Is it over 20 employees or under 20 employees? If the employer has less than 20 employees, then they would get a notice saying state continuation. If it is over 20, then they would get documents that would be COBRA. So most people have heard of COBRA, which usually means that the plan will continue as is. So they have multiple options. Uh, so they have COBRA or state continuation, depending on group size. They have marketplace, which means that they would go to healthcare.gov or get an insurance broker or agent to help them with that to submit the application and get enrolled in a plan. They can go directly with the insurance carrier. They can do it directly, or I would suggest use a, a broker or an agent because it's not gonna cost them anything else, any more than what they would if they get themselves. However, the broker or agent will usually help simplify the process for them, especially if you've just gone through a divorce. There's so many emotions going on you don't want to think clear or it's hard to think clearly. There's just a lot going on. A, a broker is going to help them clarify questions, answer, do a lot for them to make it easier. There's also uh, Medicaid, which here in Oregon is Oregon um, health plan uh, based on um, the family size as well as income. And then if the person is 65 or over, 
they might qualify for uh, Medicare or they might already be on Medicare, maybe not, you know, and then there's a supplement that goes with that. And then you get your VA TRICARE, things of that nature. So there's multiple options and the person may or may not know what they qualify for. And that's where an insurance professional can help them answer the questions and help them see what is the best option for them that's going to make sense for them. Well, that sounds like they have a ton of options, actually. Um, so maybe let's talk a little bit about some of the some of the differences in what situations someone may be in that may want them to to choose one or the other. Um, I wanted to start one with um, what if the person has their own employer huh? who they don't have insurance through because they're with their spouse had it. Um, right. Can they go to their employer and say, hey, I want to get insurance right away? Yes. So that is another option. Absolutely. Uh, sometimes the, uh, the spouses have, they're under the one like you mentioned, because it's either more cost effective or it's better coverage. But if the spouse that's losing their coverage has insurance through their employer, the mere fact that they are losing their coverage through no fault of their own, that is a special election period. So it allows them to take that letter that says, this is my last day of coverage and go to their employer and get enrolled in their employer's plan uh, under that special election period because they have a qualifying event. The loss of other coverage is that qualifying event. And so the employer will have them fill out the form either online or on paper. They'll ask what's the date of the qualifying event, which is the insurance companies are asking that. And the employer may ask for the proof of it and that way they keep it in the file. So having that letter that says when the last day of coverage is, is very important. Uh, and the employer will be contributing at least 50% of the employee only premium which is a good thing. That means that they don't have to cover 100% of it. If they go on state continuation or COBRA, they're paying 100% of the premium plus a, a certain fee on top of that. Going through their employer might be a more cost uh, effective for them and maybe even a, a good coverage plan. The, if they go on their own employer's group plan, or if they go to, like you said, to the marketplace and get an individual plan. Now, those are not the same plans that they were on before, right? Probably not. Usually group plans have a broader, not always, but most of the time there's an option for a broader network of providers. When you go with individual plans, a lot of the individual plans require having medical homes or uh, having asking for referrals. There may be no out of network coverages. Uh, there might be limits to certain number of visits. So there's a lot of different things when you're looking at individual plans. Group plans, and depending again on what plan they enrolled in, might allow them to go out of network and pay a, a percent um, versus the, that copay, that flat dollar if they're in network. They have that flexibility. Um, they may have a larger network of providers. So if they're going to a specific provider, the individual plan may or may not have that same provider in their network. And so then it's which under which carrier can they have their same providers and then looking for that. So to try to mirror as close to, but most of the time it's not gonna be the same. Um, deductibles and max out of pockets might be similar but the network of providers in the hospital systems may differ. Yeah. Then COBRA, which is the same exact plan, isn't that correct? Correct. If, if, so if I'm on COBRA and, and I've still got, I'm in the middle of the year, let's say, it's stayed, and I know that I've got some deductibles that I may have used up and I may have had some other uh, coverage or stuff happens, so I've, I've had to pay for that. Um, if I were to take COBRA, would I have to pay all those over again? Am I on like a different set of plans for them or is it really just continuing my old plan? So if you stay on COBRA and on that same exact plan, your deductible, your max out of pocket, anything that you've already put into it or spent will continue on for the rest of the year. 
if you move on to an individual plan or even your own group plan, you start all over. So those are things to consider. How much have you spent on your services? If you've not used your insurance, if you've only done an annual physical and maybe some labs, then going on another plan, no big deal because you haven't spent any money towards that deductible. But if you've already either met the deductible or met the max out of pocket, and you're on a, already on a, on a plan of, of, um, with your providers, you may wanna stick with that plan and it, it might behoove the person to yes, pay more, but when they look at, is it okay, is it better to spend a little bit more monthly on the premium or is it better starting all over with another $4,500 deductible and an 8,150 max out of pocket? Which one is gonna be more cost effective? And that's where uh, an insurance professional can help them decide that, look at the numbers, look at what are their needs to help them really decide what's best for them. But yeah, the plan either on state continuation or COBRA would be the exact same plan and the continuation of deductible and max out of pocket for the remainder of that calendar year because deductibles start all over on January 1st. Look, there's a lot of things you have to consider here. Yes. That's, I don't know what to say the bad news, but the good news is a lot of things you can consider here. Yes. Um, the, you're kind of going back to COBRA and actually all of these. Um, let's say, what about your kids? Let's say I have two children. Are, are they having these same options or is it just for the spouse? No, the children do also. And even with a, with a family of two adults, two children, there, there are limits that the children can still be on CHIP or, or Medicaid or Oregon Health Plan, depending on how you want to call it. Um, they can qualify based on family size and income. So there's a lot of times that the children are already on the Oregon Health Plan on the CHIP program, and it's only about the spouse coming off the, the company plan or the spouse's plan. Uh, but if the children are on the company plan and they're coming off, if it is not required, and sometimes it's, the courts will require the one parent to pay for the coverage for their children. So they can remove the ex-spouse and keep the children on their plan. And so then the ex-spouse gets their own and the children stay on the company plan. And one of the good reasons to keep the children on your own, if, if it's the spouse that has to pay for the insurance, is that it's pre-tax dollars. And so they're covering them with a probably a decent plan, pre-tax dollars versus having to pay an individual plan post-tax dollars. But then again, the children could potentially qualify for Oregon Health Plan, and it's looking at the overall situation, And if we, and which is really hard, but if we take a motion out of it and look at what's best for the children, what's best economically for the person that is having to provide the insurance, is it keeping them on their plan, or is it looking at an individual plan or looking to see if they qualify for Oregon Health Plan. So there are options for the children too. Are there any limits on the COBRA coverage or on the Oregon continuation coverage? Can they just do it till they don't want to do it or are, are, are there some limits there? There are limits. So under state continuation, it's nine months that they can keep the coverage. And for COBRA, it's 36 months. Now they can drop it sooner than that. So if they, if they just need it for this year, the remainder of this year, but I wanna go on a individual plan because it, it's gonna be a lot less expensive. I don't need to worry about my deductible, my max out of pocket, my providers are in network. They can drop it after X number of months. They're, they can do their open enrollment, get on an individual plan. Um, they can do the same with COBRA. Uh, but some people, if, I actually came across uh, some families that they had been laid off and so they're now on COBRA and looking at the dollars, it was gonna behoove them to stay on COBRA because it was actually because they were in their 60s. COBRA was actually less expensive than individual plans because of their income. They didn't qualify for any tax credits, which meant they had to pay 100% of the premium. Paying COBRA even with the fee was less expensive. But I said, once that runs out 36 months later, call me and then we'll look at individual plans. So nine months for state continuation, 36 for COBRA. The, so that's a lot, again, I was saying that's a lot to consider. There's a lot of different things to consider. 
And to throw a whole nother consideration to the mix, let's talk ACA, the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, some people call it, um, whatever people want to call it, that throws an entirely new twist on making this decision because isn't it right that on Obamacare, on the ACA, again, Affordable Care Act, you may qualify for a discount that you wouldn't with COBRA or going on, you know, keeping on the covered somehow. Right. And the, when it comes to the marketplace, uh, or, or the Affordable Care Act, because really the Affordable Care Act encompasses a lot, including the group plans that are out there. There's a, all the, the 10 essential health benefits that is under both individual and group plans. So unless you're self-funded, you're having to at this point comply across the board. But when we're looking at that tax credit and cost sharing assistance, the cost, the tax credit is a dollar amount that is given to the person per month or yearly, depending on how they want to take it. Most people take it per month based on their household size and income will determine that. When it comes to cost sharing, that is reducing the deductible and reducing the max out of pocket and reducing the co-pays. So there, if somebody has a normally a, a plan that has a $4,500 deductible, depending on their income and household size, it may bring that deductible down to $1,500, $750, or even $500 for the deductible. The max out of pocket from $8,150 may be brought down to $6,000 or $4,000 or even $2,000. So it just depends. So there's a lot of things to look at. And when somebody is looking at what's the best way, they have to look at, okay, what is the anticipated income for this year or for next year, depending on when we're looking at it, What's the anticipated income? How many people are in their household? And by their household, I mean that they are gonna have on their taxes, not just that you know, aunt and uncle and the grandparents live in their house. It's not that, it's who do you have as dependents on your taxes? And you must file taxes. That's very, very important because there's reporting that needs to go along when you do your taxes to utilize the, the 1095A that you get through marketplace to say, okay, this is the amount of tax credit that I received based on the income that I reported. And then what the IRS will do, it'll say, okay, you reported this on marketplace, but you reported this on your 1040. If those don't match, you're either going to have to pay money back to the IRS, or you might get a credit back from the IRS. So that's, we can look at that. And the income can be adjusted at any time during the year. So if somebody gets a raise, then it's let's make that update. Because if we don't adjust it in the middle of the year and have that tax credit go down where you pay a little bit more, guess what? You're still going to have to pay for it. Now you're going to be in a lump sum at the end of the year versus that extra 20 or $50 every month for the rest of the year. The, the, um, well, how to put this? The, the whole idea of the ACA and, and its, and its um, discounts, uh, not only, as you were kind of talking, goes to, uh, you know, kind of figuring out who's the household, what makes up the household, uh, but it also makes it uh, about the dependents. And I, so I kind of wanted to stop here, and I, we hadn't talked about talking about this before, but You've mentioned dependents a couple of times and you've said that they're, you know, they're not necessarily the same. And I kind of want to explore that because dependents in the insurance world can include people who are not necessarily going to qualify for dependents for the federal rules and the tax world. Isn't that true? So the, for the most part, the dependence on your, yes, your dependence on your taxes may be different than the dependence that you have uh, under the marketplace or even at an employer plan. So on an employer plan, you can only add your spouse and children, adopted children. If you have kids, and you know, there's, there's rules all, along with that. You cannot add parents to a group plan. You also cannot add parents to your, uh, to your own personal plan. But if you are applying on marketplace and you're looking for that tax credit and you have a parent 
as a dependent that is reliant on you, you can put them on there as a family member. Now, if they're already retired, they're on Medicare, but they're still relying on you and you're, they're on your taxes that is the, as a dependent, you wanna claim them because if it is the, the head of household, one child, and then the parent, that's a family of three. It's different than if it's a family of two or a family of one. So you wanna include all family members that are on your taxes because it's the entire household income and then based on who needs coverage, is it the, the one person and the child, or is it just the, the, the mother or the father and the child is on Oregon Health Plan? So we wanna make sure that we include all dependents as a household unit. That doesn't mean we're gonna look for coverage for everybody. It just means we have to claim everybody that's on that, on the taxes, because it could make the difference if somebody qualifies for a tax credit or doesn't qualify for a tax credit. Because the more people in the household, the higher the, the threshold is for getting the credit. Correct. I like that. The, let's talk then again about, you know, we've talked about the ACA, which, which has its kind of the same as other insurances, except you add in whether you get a, a credit or not, uh, or a discount or not. Um, we've talked about COBRA, which is basically keeping the same at least for a while. Yeah. Um, and then you mentioned you threw in um, Medicare, and that's interesting. So for older folks, um, not to say such as myself, but maybe such not as there myself, yet. Um, that can be a very viable option, can it? Even because there, there are you know, people getting divorced older as they get older. Yeah, so Medicare is for those individuals that are 65, uh, are on end-stage renal, or have other disabilities. So there's very specific rules. For the most part, it's going to be individuals that are on, um, that are, have already hit 65. And so when, and sometimes somebody is already on Medicare, but also has a group plan. And so they have that dual coverage. And the option that they have is if they are on Medicare is to keep their Medicare and then add a supplemental plan to help cover what Medicare doesn't cover. Uh, or if they're not on Medicare is going on Medicare and adding that supplemental plan. So that, that's kind of the option. If somebody qualifies for Medicare, they cannot go on um, the marketplace. They are disqualified if they qualify for other coverage. So if somebody qualifies for Oregon Health Plan, if they qualify for VA, if they qualify for Medicare, they cannot be on Marketplace. The, um, the Marketplace will not, even if they're low income, they will not qualify to receive any tax credit. It would be paid at 100% of the premium of that plan. The other thing is that if somebody qualifies for Medicare, if we get them a plan individually directly with the insurance carrier, the insurance carrier will treat them as though they are on Medicare and won't pay the same. They will pay secondary. They'll say, well, we would only pay X amount of dollars because you are or should be on Medicare. So if somebody qualifies for Medicare, they truly should be on Medicare. It's gonna, they're gonna be better off. The cost of the plan, it's very different than if you're paying over $1,000 for an individual plan. I mean, that, that's a lot of money where you can be on the Medicare plan with the supplement paying. Sometimes it's very low or you pay nothing just depending on what supplement plan you get on. And I don't do Medicare. That's, I usually have my other agents that I work with that I say, hey, take care of my clients. They're turning 65, take good care of them. This is what they need. And so then they, um, those agents will go into a lot of detail and ask a lot more questions to make sure that the person is getting the coverage that they need based on their particular needs. The, I think there, there there's one other sort of interesting coverage. I think it's an, on the Oregon continuation in there and it's for, because you, you, had, you had mentioned about how expensive it is for individuals, let's say age 55 to 65, to get individual insurance because it's rated on age. And it's, it's so expensive that it's actually better, if you can, to a lot of times stay on a what would normally be higher uh, cost group plan. 
but isn't there isn't there a, a a way that following a divorce someone can get a cobra like or continuation type plan like on their group on the group plan and stay on it where they may not otherwise qualify to do it so there there's i don't know if i quite understand the question so they can stay on their the current plan that they're on um so long as they are doing it within a you know they usually have about 60 days from the time they're the ending of the plan and when they're they've been given and usually the letters will state you have until this date to opt in for say continuation or cobra or you can go into your own group plan so if you have an option to go on to your own group plan under your company that you work for it will disqualify you from getting a tax credit because it has to be at a certain percent that you're paying and with the employer paying at least 50 percent of the plan it, it the math doesn't jive and so the marketplace will actually do the math on it and will say nope you don't qualify so the person would then have to pay a full price the person could pay full price for a bronze plan with a higher deductible but we look at how often do they need coverage it's all about their needs and if being on that bronze plan um, even though it's monthly less expensive it's going to cost them more if they have medical needs so we always look at the numbers what is going to be best for the person that needs the coverage uh, and for how long and we can make that change every year so if somebody were to get on a plan for an uh, you know the first of the month coming up we can still review during open enrollment for next year and say okay for this year you're good here under this plan but does it make sense to keep you on that same plan for next year so it's about looking at that every year because people's needs change every year and so we want to make sure we address that i i i get it i get it the want to do what kind of talk about one last subject here and get back to something you said which was that there are some deadlines and there's some you know like you said periods where you can enroll and and this kind of gets back to what we earlier talked about about how you can be proactive to make sure that your coverage stays protected um can kind of expand on that just a little bit and what people should be doing right. uh, if they're thinking of getting of being divorced, if they're in the middle of one, when it's finalized, I mean, I, I'm, I take it you shouldn't just sit around and wait for something to happen. Right, that's so important. I was talking to somebody last week and she says, oh, I just found out my coverage ended in June. Oops, she yeah. had no idea. Stay in communication with your ex if you can, that is so important, asking them having that conversation as to when their coverage is going to end um, that, that's very important and staying in contact with the insurance company sometimes the hr people may not know the benefits people may not know sometimes they will sometimes they won't but calling the insurance company knowing when their last day is that's very important looking at all documents they're receiving so if they know that their insurance is going to end because their divorce is finalized this month, then assume that my coverage is ending at the end of the month. They can, once the coverage has ended, then they can ask the insurance company to give them a letter of credible coverage. They usually can't get it till the, after the last day of their coverage, but this letter states when their coverage began, when it ended, and they can use that as proof. So if you know the insurance is ending at the end of this month, I wanna in, get insured the first of next month, you can take care of doing that. You still have to provide proof of loss, which means a letter from the employer or a notification from COBRA or state continuation or a letter from the insurance company saying this is the last day of coverage, whatever it may be. You have to have that coverage or that letter that shows when your coverage ends. Ask. It's yep. very important that you ask. If you're not sure, ask. You can call your ex and say, hey, when, when's the last day of my coverage? You know, let me know. And if there's at least that communication, then that's important. And, and I think keeping the communication with your soon to be ex is the most important piece because that way there's no surprises, especially if you have medical needs, especially if you have children, you don't want that lapse in coverage because yeah. if I don't find out till next month that my coverage ended this month, 
now I'm going to be one month without coverage. There are short term policies that the person can get that could be for usually it's 30 days, but some of them will allow for two weeks a week. But for the most part, it's 30 days. So you pay a little bit less for that 30 day coverage, which will give you a chance to get into the the next phase. So you have that 60 day window from the last day of coverage to when you apply for your for coverage again. That doesn't mean it's going to start within that 60 days, but you have to apply within 60 days. Um, but ask. Don't don't just wait around. Um, a lot of emotions are going on, but it's also important to stay on on track if it means you know a little check off list you know who do i need to ask who you know whether it's the insurance company whether it's the x you know trying to find those things out are, is very very important and i guess bottom line if someone is worried call you i mean call an, call an insurance agent because that's what they're they're there to do that to make sure you don't lapse you don't miss those deadlines you know you yeah. know you now notify we'll ask the right those people. Questions. Yeah, we'll ask. It's like, do you have the letter that shows when your last day of coverage is? The answer for the most part is no, I don't. And then it's, could you get it? You know, yeah. could you, you know, ask your, your ex, you know, to get it for you to provide it. Uh, some of them will call the employer and saying, I know my coverage is ending. Can uh, you confirm the date and can you write me a letter? Can you send me an email? Can you give me something? Uh, calling the insurance companies. I mean, we're, we're going to guide you as to the things. Those are things we can't do for you because of HIPAA laws. We're not allowed, but we can guide you as to who to ask, who to go to. Right. Uh, and then we can start the process and start getting things going so that once we have it, it's like, boom, we submit it. Um, and they give us time. The marketplace will give us time to submit that document, but we have a certain window to submit it to show proof that the person has lost coverage. So thank you so much, Gladys. I, I think what this really shows is that divorce doesn't mean the end of your insurance. Uh, there, right. are, there are multiple ways to continue coverage or get new coverage and not to have that terrible situation where you have an illness or accident and you're not covered because right. it could all go back to the date you had lost coverage, you know, as mm -hmm. long as you, again, stay on top of it. Yes. And, and that's wonderful information. Um, the sooner you start asking those questions, the better. I have people yeah. that says, I know that my last day of employment is three months out, or, or I know I'm going to get divorced. What are my options? And we start talking about it now so yeah. that by the time all that yuckiness and emotions are, are high, they at least have a plan. They already know this is what I'm going to do. I already know. Uh, and it'll make life so much easier. One less thing to worry about because you've already started the process. Yep. Um, well, and talk to, even if it's not me, talk to, you know, if you go to healthcare.gov, you can look up local agent assistance in your own state, you know, especially if you're moving out of state, you know, you're going to find help, you know, just yep. have somebody. It's not going to cost you any more if you get some help. So why not do it? Yep. That's exactly right. Because well, as you said, insurance agents, for health insurance, don't you know? They don't get paid directly from you. They get they get a commission, and whether they buy it through you or not, they pay the same. So right. use the experts. So Gladys, thank you so much for being here today. This is wonderful, great information. You know, anyone who finds himself in this situation, it's going to be helpful for. So yes, thanks so much. Oh, thanks for yeah. having me today. This has been great. It has been wonderful, and you know, I also want to thank everyone who's joined in, who's tuned in today. Um, and also encourage you to ask any questions um, if you've got from today's you know, broadcast, just shoot me an email. I'm at steve at landerhomelaw.com. I can get you connected with Gladys. So feel free. If you got questions, this is the time to ask. And until next time, everyone stay well, stay happy, have a great day. Adios.